I'm Corbett Wall with DV Auction here with your feeder flash for Friday October the 1st hard to believe we're in the last quarter right now brought to you in part by Zach Tran stress just like weaning this time of the year and a big temperature change opens the gate to bovine respiratory disease slam it shut with Zach Tran remember to observe your 35 day withdrawal period after treatment for more information go to ZachTran.com or visit with your BI representative. Uh, you guys listen to what I talk about all the time that we need uh, minimum negotiated cash trade. Uh, you know, we don't fight hard enough to uh, use the leverage whenever we have it, uh, especially in our, in our fat cattle sector. And, and it, hurts, uh, it hurts everybody below that. And uh, I just kind of wanted to share a story with you that I've been going to tell on the feeder flash, but I never have. Uh, you know, when I was with USDA for nearly 20 years, I was afforded opportunities to go all over the country and do a lot of different things. I was visiting recently uh, with a good friend of mine, uh, Dave Foster, down in Louisiana. Uh, he kind of heads up uh, cattle producers of Louisiana down there. And uh, he worked uh, with, or he and I worked together for a long time, but we were visiting. And he was originally from New York State, so he was familiar uh, with uh, the New England part of the country well uh, almost 25 years ago about 23 years ago I was transferred up to New Holland Pennsylvania and I reported to market up there for an ag marketing service of USDA and uh, I, I was the, the northeasternmost representative of the ag marketing service well they had started a program right before I got there uh, with the state of Vermont and I know that sounds like oh, a long ways up there, but I want to tell you the story about the Vermont Beef Producers Feeder Cattle Auction. And I want you to, to kind of put it in perspective of, of kind of the whole, um, uh, as, as a microcosm of the whole cattle industry. Cattle people are pretty much the same everywhere and it just kind of fits together. But when I got up to, to uh, Pennsylvania, uh, there were several programs that were going uh, that I became uh, a part of or kind of supervised. I, uh, my uh, supervisor at the time was out of Washington, D.C., but uh, he had a house and ran cattle near Broadway, Virginia. For you Virginia people, you guys know where that's at. Skip Bevan, I had a lot of respect for him. He was a great guy. He was an Oklahoma panhandle guy originally, and, and he and I kind of clicked. and and I uh, still I always liked Skip, I always respect him uh, for, the, for the things that he did for me at the time, but uh, he kind of took me by the hand and showed me these programs they had going. One of them was with Vermont beef producers. Now up in Vermont they don't raise many uh, cattle, and I, see, and I hate to say beef cattle because that makes you sound like you don't know anything about cattle, but uh, they didn't raise a lot of regular cattle up there. Mostly had dairy type cattle, but there was a few producers up there that had, had started running cattle, uh, regular cattle, a lot of Angus, Angus or Angus Cross cattle up there. Uh, some of them were retired dairy farmers that still had a farm or some pasture there. Other people were landowners and they were kind of hobby farmers, but they were raising some pretty good cattle up there. And so they had a, a group that had a cluster of, of pretty good kind of cattle. Uh, they couldn't find a market for them. Well, they had noticed that down in the state of New York, uh, through Cornell University, uh, which, you know, you're thinking, oh my God, this doesn't sound like it has anything to do with cattle. But, you know, even up there, uh, you know, in the Ivy League type schools, they still have agriculture in some of them. There's a guy named Mike Baker that worked with uh, University Extension with Cornell, and he was having uh, graded commingled feeder cattle auctions in the state of, of New York. And we graded those sales up there. And, and you know, I've been afforded opportunities to go a lot of neat places and, and see all that. But this group out of Vermont, they were looking for a market for their cattle. They were trying to find buyers that were interested in their cattle outside the region because they just weren't finding anything. Uh, most of the time they would have to take their cattle to the auctions and the auctions, about the only thing they sold were, were out dairy cows, just way up dairy cows or, uh, or uh, Bob Veal or, or newborn um, dairy calves. And that's about the only thing they sold. 
And so if they took some cattle in there, it didn't really matter how nice they were. They could have been all black and really good kind of Angus Cross cattle in there. And they would bring 50 cents a pound because that's what the dairy steers, the Holstein steers or the, or the Jersey Cross steers or even the Brown Swiss steers were bringing us about 50 cents a pound. It didn't really matter what they weighed, whether they weighed three or, or 1,100 pounds, they'd bring about 50 cents per pound. Well, they, they were seeing that cattle were bringing more than that, you know, all over the country, and they wanted to tap into that. So they got uh, in touch with us, and they had just kind of started that sale up there, and they were having a co-mingled sale. You had to get bigger bunches, uh, you know, in, in order to attract buyers from outside the region for trucking purposes and things like that. Well, to co-mingle those cattle, you had to treat them all the same way. So all those cattle needed to be weaned, uh, you know, at least 30 days weaned. Of course, we like more than that now, but back then 30 days was kind of the, uh, the set uh, threshold there, and they all had to have the same vaccinations. So everybody that wanted to consign cattle to that sale, they had to get them weaned, they had to get them vaccinated and all that kind of thing. Well, they were all gung-ho about it, and so they all did that, and, and they started bringing the cattle into the sale. Well, uh, you know, immediately the cattle started bringing uh, exponentially better than what they had, they had been bringing before. You know, they weren't bringing 50 cents a pound anymore. They were bringing up closer to the market, but you know, it still wasn't anything on fire or anything, but uh, it was getting better and they liked that. And you know, and they were having, you know, seven, 800 head of cattle at these first sales. And then I started going up there and helping sort that graded sale. And, and they were asking me, uh, you know, what can we do to, to, uh, to improve this sale? And uh, I said, well, you can you can get a, a decent auctioneer that that uh, you know takes less than five dollar a hundred licks, and so well who can we find to do that? Well, so I started selling the the sale form in Vermont, auctioneering it off, and we said well we can do a tele auction like they do in, in Virginia, and we can have people get online uh, or on the phone there, not online but on the phone. We didn't have. Uh, you know online sales with video like I do here with DV auction now but back in those days uh, we started uh, the the tele auction like they did in Virginia and I described uh, the cattle and they'd have a sheet that showed you know what the weights were and what the grades were of the cattle and, and how many different producers they'd come from and and they would start bidding people from Virginia uh, Indiana Ohio even people out in Iowa started bidding on that sale and and that sale got really hot because they had good cattle, a lot of good genetics there. Sale got really hot and they started selling cattle as much as or even higher uh, as the central part of the United States and, and get along great. And, and, you know, it was impressive how, you know, those cattle went from bringing 50 cents a pound to all of a sudden bringing market price or better and a lot better if you figured the freight difference. And so, you know, we think, man, we really helped these people uh, and aided them in marketing, which was part of our job with Ag Marketing Service. Well, uh, it didn't take very long right after that, that the, the pin hookers, the traders, the guys that had been buying them for 50 cents a pound uh, in, the, in the sales, in the cow sales, the out cow sale, sales, way up sales, and the veal sales, they started going around to some of those producers before we uh, we would come in for that sale and say, I'll tell you what, uh, we, will, we will just, uh, when, when they get done with that sale, we'll just buy those cattle off of you direct out here in the country for, for $10 back or whatever. And, and we don't care if you get them weaned or vaccinated or anything like that. We'll just, uh, we'll just offer you an alternative marketing agreement an AMA and you can you can do right here you won't have to put the you know do all that work and everything I know you guys don't have time to do it or the facilities and and then you won't have to take them into that uh, that sale and sweat the market or anything you know we'll just buy them ten dollars back after the sales over whatever that market report is for those weights of cattle and we'll buy them off of you there and and those people were so quick to say oh yeah we'll do that no problem well what happens the same thing that happens in your feedlots nowadays when we don't have any negotiated trade. When you don't have enough people doing it, you don't have any leverage. So, so we started uh, immediately seeing fewer and fewer producers bringing cattle into that commingled sale. And, and within about three or four years, it just dried up. After we were having nice sales there with good sized bunches 
and uh, and demand from outside the area it just dried up because we, we didn't have enough volume uh, to keep people interested we didn't have any leverage to make a market and uh, and that's I, I think about that story and, and about those years of going out to Vermont and doing that and I just think you know how stupid were they you know and a lot of them weren't uh, you know people that were in the beef business and I have no ill will against any of them there's great people out there but we're just as stupid in our feedlot areas in the five area feeding region now nobody sells negotiated they're all quick to, to pick up some kind of a alternative marketing agreement or just turn them in on the grid or or the big outfits of course get in crawl in bed with the Packers with a sweetheart deal and then you've got no negotiated trade and, and no negotiated trade kills the leverage on the little dab of negotiated trade you have and then everybody else is selling off of that and we wonder why we can't gain any ground in, in your on your cattle market and that's just a microcosm of, of the the whole deal and uh, if you guys think about that and you know the we, we can't ever get our heads together we wonder why those four packers out trade us every week is because it just takes so much more effort to get 400 heads together or 4,000 heads together than it does four and and that's the moral of that story let's look at your board on Thursday October live cattle futures got beat up pretty hard down a buck 20 at 120.57 December down a buck 32 at 125.72 your back months your live cattle down 117 to down 197 October feeder cattle down 207 they got hurt pretty bad too I think a lot of it had to do uh, with the 3.5 million dollar infrastructure bill and, and everybody just thinking about how uh, this 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 country is just getting so used to to uh, you know being a freeloader state uh, welfare type deals you know I, it was kind of you know we we're kind of in doldrums uh, late in the week here but October feeders down 207 at 152.55 November down 237 at 152.90 your back months on feeder cattle down 217 to down 257 uh, your corn uh, down a little bit, two and a quarter cent a bushel at 536 and three quarters. Fat cattle trade, we had a little bit more trade on Thursday, but most of it happened on Wednesday. And like I said on our last visit, pretty decent trade for the way we do things now. And uh, packers need cattle, don't let them uh, pretend that they don't, even though they're, they're slowing down kills right now. They want to get cattle kind of put together. I wouldn't doubt that a lot of this week's purchases were for the two to four week delivery because they like to kind of get things set up. Uh, we'll find out early next week about that. But Iowa, 3,600 head confirmed on Thursday, 28,700 head for the week. That's a lot. Uh, your, your cash or your live sales were pretty much steady in all your uh, five area feeding region. Dress sales one to two dollars lower, but Iowa live sales 121 to 124. Dress sales 192 to 196. Nebraska 1400 head confirmed, about 20,000 for the week. 122 to 124 live, 194 to 196 dressed. Kansas 1600 on Thursday confirmed, 9600 head for the week mostly 124 Texas 700 head on Thursday 7200 head for the week all at 124 on Thursday's confirmed sales box beef cutout values were a lot lower you know I told you your packers are, are backing off on harvest one one thing to kind of shore up uh, some uh, the market on the on the cattle side because they know they're running into a period of time where they have smaller numbers or supplies of market ready cattle and then at the same time uh, they can they can slow that harvest down a little bit and it'll bring uh, those purchasers of their product to their milk a little bit and kind of help them shore up their box beef cutout values uh, choice cuts down 235 on Thursday 294.98 uh, selects down 246 at 269.32. Your slaughter's been disappointing this week. 473,000 through Thursday. That's 4,000 less than last week, 3,000 less than the same week a year ago. Actual slaughter information for the week ending September the 18th had your average dress steer carcass weight at 912 pounds. That's three pounds heavier than the previous report, but still eight pounds less than the same report from a year ago. 
I want to tell you a beef story here too. It's story time here on Feeder Flash. I hope you guys enjoy them as much as I enjoy telling them. But my good friends, the Herzogs, auction people in Butler, Missouri. That's, that's East Central or West Central Missouri right there, right on the Kansas line. They own Mocan Livestock Market there outside of Butler, Missouri. And, uh, you know, I, I was uh, supervising the reporting of their market there, reported their market a lot of times there. Uh, Jim Herzog and his boys, uh, they, they've, uh, you know, were always good to me and, and became good friends of mine. Here, it hasn't been a year and a half ago, I don't believe. They called me and they wanted to come down to, to the Canyon, Texas area and tour uh, the West Texas A&M University, my alma mater, uh, meet uh, department there and the abattoir that they had built or Cavanus helped them build and, and Paul Engler helped them build because it's, it's uh, about the nicest in the country and they wanted to come down and tour that. and so. They had set up a tour and come down and we had dinner and we had a good visit and, and uh, had a good time and they were talking about uh, building their own uh, little packing plant there and you hear a lot of people talking about doing it well when they went back home they didn't fool around they got right with it and started doing it and they have it built uh, you know they've spent the money they've done the work uh, Todd Herzog uh, son of Jim there he's been the main one uh, that, that's learned how to, to, to work a packing plant it's a small plant there but you know we're talking about locally raised beef and how we need more of that kind of stuff well they indeed built one it's state-of-the-art and I mean fancy uh, doing a really good job I've been watching them on Facebook and different places and and they've got some some really nice cattle that they've fed up all NHTC and natural and they dry age their beef and age it for a long time and they've got it good and tender and and about as good a quality as you can possibly get it's all locally raised right there and, and slaughtered in their facility they've got a retail store there it's just right outside Butler at the Passaic exit there right right, right next to their sale barn uh, Mocan livestock market but uh, and if you're in that area I, I encourage you to to uh, to go by there and buy some beef from them because it, it'd be as good as you could find anywhere but they had looked into expanding their markets and and I'd seen where they had got into some some bigger grocery stores not just your little mom and pops but they had went up towards Kansas City and gotten in a, a big uh, chain uh, grocery store by the name of High V, which you're in the Kansas City area. That's big time. They always, uh, you know, advertised and supported uh, Kansas City Chiefs and were big sponsors of that. Uh, but I'd seen where they'd gotten into High V uh, supermarkets there in the Kansas City area. And then not only did they get one, they got in two and three, and, and, and they just kept expanding. I thought, oh my gosh. These guys are doing such a great job and, and uh, people started getting some of that locally raised beef and it was very high in quality and they started loving it and uh, man it's just going gangbusters. Well Jim and Todd called me here this week and, and told me well uh, uh, the, the meat mafia has gotten to us. So, uh, you know, corporate had called down to that high V stores there, uh, seeing what the deal was. Somebody tattled to them, to your big uh, corporate uh, beef processors, and told them what was going on. And they put a stop to it, and I mean right now. They, uh, corporate told their, their stores down there, uh, you're, you're going to pull all that Herzog Meat Company beef, pull it off of the shelves, and we're not going to be selling that anymore. And, uh, you know, and that's what we get into. Uh, the mafia, uh, its roots were in the meatpacking districts in those big eastern towns. And it's still that way. They put their foot down. They laid the hammer down. They did not want to give up any of their margin, any of their uh, percentage of the business there. Especially not to some uh, uh, hokey uh, local guys there, sale barn guys that are put in a, a local uh, packing plant and we're raising top quality local beef there. But that's what we're up against, guys. And, uh, and I hope you guys uh, go and, and uh, do business with the Herzog Meat Company there outside of Butler, Missouri, uh, right on the, the highway there. And, uh, and, and just remember kind of what we're up against when you go to these big 
uh, corporate uh, widespread uh, grocery uh, supermarkets there. Uh, they're not really out for, for providing top quality product. They have to answer to the same damn corporate assholes that the cattle people have to answer to on the other end. Let's talk about your feeder cattle markets, your real time index on DV auction. Late in the day on Thursday, you said at 150.46, that was down 17 cents. Uh, your big sales on Thursday. Uh, winter livestock in Pratt, 2100 head. Market was kind of uneven. Uh, of course, you can't tell the market reporters in Kansas suck so bad. You can't tell uh, what's coming or going, so you just, well, not even uh, read the market report. But I'm going to give you some quotes out of there. Pratt, Kansas sold some big yearling steers pretty darn good. 58 head, weighed 895 at 159.50. Farmers and ranchers livestock uh, straight north of there, north central Kansas and Salina, 1,800 head there. Couldn't tell heads or tails about what the market reporter was trying to say there on the federal state market report. Uh, likely, your big yearling type cattle, if they're, if they're, if, uh, you know, they're sure enough yearlings, they were selling better and your ball and calves were not, but they couldn't explain that on the market report. But top sale out of Salina, Kansas, 59 head, 968 pound yearling feeder steers, 155 and a quarter. Wow. Belfouche Livestock Market, Belfouche, South Dakota. I keep telling you guys about these light calves that they're selling up there in the dry regions of South Dakota, uh, Eastern Montana, North Dakota up in there. If you guys want some wheat cattle that's got some go to them and all kinds of quality, if you think you can get them straightened up. Now, most of these are not going to be weaned, but they are ranch raised. Uh, genetics be great and health be great uh, until you get them. <laughs> then that's what happens. But I looked at the automated market report from Bell Foosh, which that's the only place you're going to see that market reported unless they pay for it. Under 600 pound feeder steers and heifers, three to five dollars lower. Over 600 pounds, two to seven dollars higher. Uh, best tested weights out of Bell Foosh, 792 head of four weight steers, average 459 at 188.74 on the weighted average price. Now that's nothing to sneeze at, but for the kind of quality you're talking about, I think you guys are missing the boat if you're in the market for some calves. You need to go up there and, and tap into some of those. 961 head of five weight steer calves in Belfouche, average 528 at 173.13 on the weighted average price. How about some heifers? They're not keeping many of those back. 957 head of four weight heifer calves in Belfouche, Average 455 with a weighted average price of 163.24. Don't forget St. Ange got a big sale here on Friday, about 7,000 calves, 700 yearlings, and then 2,000 way up cows on Saturday. You think it ain't dry out there? But the best quote that I saw anywhere on Thursday, for the way things are, some of these bigger calves are kind of hard to sell right now. You're getting into the fall of the year, but at mid Missouri stockyards, Phillipsburg or Lebanon, Missouri, their DV auction customers there, they sold 69 head, 637 pound black steer calves at 164.85. That's your feeder flash for Friday.